Um, let's uh, jump to what I call building for performance. Um, so during the introduction, we said we have no developer in the panel. Uh, the goal is not bashing developers. We'll talk about uh, what's the relationship, uh, what it takes to build for performance. Uh, so maybe my first question would be, what are the role, according to you, uh, of developers in building for performance? What, their, what are their stake into making sure the software perform in a great way? Okay, so first of all, I'm still considering myself as a developer. Uh, indeed, I don't code too much today just because I have other things to also handle, but I'm still a developer and I really like developing and, and coding and I'm used to do it every week, maybe not every day. Um, that being said, um, what, what is really core at Algolia is that because we are processing something like 100 billion requests a month, out of that 40 billion queries search a month, it's really important that whatever you do that ultimately process those requests, uh, linearly scale with the amount of API calls that we experience. So it's very important that everyone understand that when you're building something, you cannot afford to lose milliseconds for every single request. Um, by saying that, Maybe the only f other thing that we would really enforce here uh, in the engineering team is making sure that what we are building is monitored. Making sure that every single piece of software that we release outside in production have great monitoring and we understand how fast, how late, and how even uh, maybe bad we are in order to improve. Cool. Okay, so um, uh, yes, I, I'm also a developer, <laughs> uh, like you, uh, I, I, and like you, um, I don't have so much time to, to code, but uh, uh, I would prefer to <laughs> to code more. Uh, and yeah, the, the, the relation that um, our developer team uh, has with the performance is um, uh, in every minute. Uh, I mean every line of code um, in uh, such a tool like a reverse proxy is kind of critical and every line of code uh, has to be um, tested and designed uh, with performance in mind. And we had multiple issues uh, in the past uh, that uh, when uh, just a few uh, little change in the code introduced a huge amount of memory leak, for example. <laughs> and uh, if, if you don't have any um, uh, r real uh, serious test um, on this, uh, you don't even see it because it's, it's just too, too little. So, yeah, uh, on, on this kind of tool, you have to code with performance as uh, one of the top priority in mind. I completely agree. The, the role of the developers at Mailjet in performance is critical. Uh, uh, you, you, they have to understand that what they are coding will be, uh, like I said, uh, processed 100 million times per day for email processing. Uh, so every time they add latency, every time they add uh, cost or CPU usage, uh, they impact the performance. And also they have to understand that everything they request from the databases are, is also really critical because we can have clients with a few uh, thousand emails per campaign, but we have uh, clients with uh, multiple million emails per campaign. So. Uh, if they design their request poorly or if they design the schema poorly, uh, it, it won't scale at all. So the, the role of the developer is critical and the, the, the role of the operations team is to uh, uh, put, put that into their mind and uh, every time show them where are the pain points in production uh, and where they can, they can improve. Cool. Uh, just to add on uh, Emil's thoughts, uh, I think 
it's especially true when you're a provider. So Emil with Traffic is uh, on the front line and is a third party. So let's consider Merljet and Algolia use Traffic. Uh, they would be very picky on the performance cost of traffic. And so uh, I'm speaking because we have the same uh, constraint at screen. So we build a service that uh, uh, monitors your request and protect your traffic against a large uh, range of vulnerabilities, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, and stuff like that. And as a third party, we very, very stressed and challenged on the overhead. Every millisecond we add to the processing has to be justified. So it's even more true when you're a provider. Not saying that uh, when you're building internally, it's easier. Just saying that you're even more on the spotlight when you're a third party. So that's uh, even more constraint you add. Uh, especially, we'll touch base on that later. Plus, you have a community of developers helping you as an open source project. So it's also managing that contribution do not uh, decrease the performance of your code and uh, that you not, for that uh, publicly traded company, you not reduce the performance, but already a few milliseconds, but uh, if we take the case of Algolia, every millisecond matters, so you can afford to lose uh, those milliseconds. Um, so we, we touch base, like uh, your point, Francois, was uh, we need to help developers, we need to educate them about what performance means in your context. So indeed, it's not often easy when you develop on a small environment to understand that your, call, your code will be called million of times. And so that little thing you do uh, will not scale at all. Uh, what kind of tool, what kind of uh, monitoring, what kind of, what do you put in place to help uh, developers doing that better? Uh, I think it's really important to give them access to logs first. Uh, being able to see uh, real life logs, real life uh, traffic. Uh, it's not just a matter of uh, having developers developing in sandboxes. We want them to be able to really understand the, the, the real, what, what is the real traffic and what, will they, what their code is handling. So uh, having them uh, access to the production logs in a secure way is really important. So that's what we try to do uh, more and more at Mailjet. And also having them understand that their uh, software has to be um, uh, monitorable uh, to, to be able to understand where are the um, uh, contentions or uh, scalability problems. So they have to also uh, seeing themselves on, on where they want to have um, a monitoring in, in the in production. Cool. Yeah, but uh, building for performance. Like uh, performance is not an afterthought. You have to integrate it from the up to the design of uh, any software for it to scale nicely. Uh, on your side, Emil, are you using any tool, any process? How do you make sure that uh, whenever you release a new version of traffic, you're not going to crash uh, everyone? So yeah, we have um, a pretty strict process uh, to manage um, the, all the contribution from the community because uh, we are a very small team to manage so much contribution. Um, for example, more than uh, uh, almost 300 people contributed to, to the project from the beginning, and, and we are we are we are just 10 people to manage this. So um, we have pretty strict process to manage this. Uh, a lot of automatic tools, uh, a lot of automatic, automatic testing. We don't even merge pull requests uh, uh, ourselves. Uh, all merge are done automatically by, uh, by bots. Uh, so um, how we manage um, uh, this is to automatize everything in our team. We are so few people to manage the whole thing that we need to automatize everything and we don't even merge anymore the pull request. So that's how we manage this. We automatize everything. Cool. Do you use any, maybe, uh, let's uh, touch base on that after. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, on our side, we have different projects and therefore we are testing different things uh, on the API, on the search API, on top of all the unit tests, we have also stress tests where we basically take multiple indices and we replay a log of requests and we just try to understand whether we have a performance regression. On the website, which is on a Ruby on Rails stack, we are using New Relic. 
um, on all the monitoring, logs, infrastructure, and log processing in, um, proce uh, yes, process. We have um, different um, statsd metrics pushed to a Wavefront um, API. Wavefront has been acquired by VMware a few years ago. It's a really performant time series database as a service. Um, so we are using them a lot. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Thanks, guys. So, yeah, so a lot of, uh, you mentioned New Relic. Uh, that's uh, what I wanted to ask. Do you use any APM, Datadog, New Relic? You mentioned logs, uh, Francois. Uh, I think you use Elasticsearch and uh, Logstash for that, if I remember well. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's not, uh, again, it's not only an afterthought. It's uh, from the way up, from the design, that you have to integrate uh, performance constraints. Um, so I think uh, that's mo most of your statement for you, uh, Francois, the network will fail. Uh, so on top of building for performance, you have to build for failure. Um, and so I was reading, reading a very cool article the other day that I can share tomorrow on Stripe, where they explain how they manage the rate limit and how they degrade the service depending on the load, depending on the incident. And so they end up killing non-critical feature just to give some air to the infrastructure and so it can continue to perform well. Uh, as you guys went thus far in implementing such strategy, how do you plan for the worst? And so uh, when it uh, rings at 4 a.m., uh, you can uh, quickly mitigate uh, the incident. Yeah. So. Um we, we built the search engine for, for months before having something stable. And once we had something stable, we were going through our providers and say, oh, can we have three machines? Because out of those three machines, we want to build a distributed consensus, deploy that search engine out of three machines, and make sure that our users are relying on a highly available, fault-tolerant search. Uh, turns out that what we didn't think about was that if those three machines are in the same rack, in the data center and the switch on top of the rack got an update, firmware update, super, super frequent. Uh, of course, the three machines are down at the same time. Not for too long, they are not really broken, but the network is still KO, so you cannot access them. So from there, we say like, okay, if the rack cannot be used, let's dispatch this machine into three different racks. And our providers were like, yeah, sure, one machine, one machine, one machine. Turns out that when the whole data center goes down, and to be honest, it doesn't happen that much in Europe and in US, but trust me, um, if you are based in New Delhi, Sao Paulo, Tokyo, it does happen. And what happens even in Europe or in the US is like, the data center is alive, but the wire that is connecting your region or your ISP to that data center, you know, there is a caterpillar building a bridge, it just cut the wires, and therefore you are reroute to another sum another pass, uh, and it's not that great. So since that day, we have been deploying the Algolia infrastructure on multiple providers, which means that every single Algolia users will be deployed on three machines hosted by different providers using different electricity providers and network providers. At that point, we were like, ah, we finally have a highly available infrastructure until our DNS providers got DDoS. So what happens then is that your machines are up and running out of three providers. Like it's highly improbable that all three together get, you know, get down. They are not even in the same city. So if, if North Korea sends a nuclear attack to New York, we are running because we have machines in Ashburn, south of New York. But if your DNS providers, the one telling your end users where your machines are, is down, you are screwed. So from that day, we are now relying on two DNS providers, and we are fallbacking through logic in the client to a different DNS domain uh, in case the, one, the first one timeouts. So yes, network issues has been something at Algolia. Um, so yeah, we, we tend to provide a lot of tools to, to manage this kind of um, disaster <laughs> uh, in, uh, in our users' infrastructure. And uh, I can t talk about few tools, like uh, we allow us to do some rate limiting, obviously. We allow us to 
we provide some uh, circuit breakers to our backend services to automatically uh, uh, mute some, uh, micro, some microservices that are uh, failing. Um, we are providing some traffic jumping, some uh, um, blue-green deployment in case of uh, new deployment. So we try uh, as a, a key um, tool in the infrastructure to provide as many to as many features possible to manage disaster uh, quickly and uh, and uh, and in a good way, but uh, but we don't have to manage disaster ourselves, so <laughs> we are good on this. <laughs> Let's imagine the worst scenario: you release a new version of traffic, uh, yeah. which causes a disaster. Oh. what's your rollback plan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we we just I don't know. <laughs> it never happened. <laughs> no, yeah, we okay, provide a patch or. We provide a patch, but uh, it should not happen. <laughs> yeah, of course, uh, let's plan for the worst. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, network will fail, database also, um, everything will fail. In fact, uh, Algolia will fail. Maybe we are relying on Algolia. Maybe it will fail. Uh, you are relying on Mailjet. Maybe we will fail. So uh, it's interesting that um, Netflix has uh, Netflix has this uh, chaos monkey concept. Uh, when you are relying on a provider, you often have you, you, you don't need Chaos Monkeys. You have your providers. Everyone is uh, familiar with the Chaos Monkey here. Who, who doesn't know what the Chaos Monkey is? Don't be shy. It's okay. Maybe you can explain. Uh, yeah, but the Netflix has this concept where uh, they break things uh, themselves in, into their data centers or in their providers to be able to see if they are reacting well on failures. They, they call that chaos monkeys, so they, sometimes they break their servers or hypervisors and so on. Just imagine a, a monkey running around and just uh, uh, pulling the wire and just trying to break everything it found. Like, uh, that's the best analogy. So the, the way we manage it at Mailjet is that we try to bring these constraints to the developers so that they can imagine what the applications will do if something is breaking. Uh, that's super important that they understand that. So when we implement Algolia, for example, we always have a, a, a path uh, that we can use if Algolia is down. And it's uh, the same way for everything and every uh, single resource we use uh, at Mailjet. So the, the, the best advice I can give is to educate uh, on, on this point, meaning that um, when there is a database problem, the problem is not uh, if the database is going well or not, is how your application is reacting to this problem. Uh, and that's really the, the, the main focus on our development teams, making sure that they understand what their application is doing when the, the component is, is failing. And it's a real mindset, a real mindset shift you have, because obviously we are optimistic people and we build uh, for the, the best. And suddenly you have people like Francois who say, okay, but... Uh, what happens if uh, this database is down? Ah, didn't plan for that. So let's go back to, to step one. Um, cool. Any, that's probably the end of the building for performance chapter. Do you guys have any question? Yeah, again, here. Do we have, yeah, here, here, here. Okay, we'll uh, probably uh, favor the people, the people who didn't ask questions yet. Let me grab the mic. Um, I have a question on, uh, so you, you talk about educating developers. How do you educate top management to that, to those, those constraints? Because we have those constraints, but we always have to deliver new features and it's always top priority for top management because performance issues are un invisible unless it crashes. Make them on call. That's as simple as that. If, the, if their phone is ringing at 4 a.m. when there is a performance issue, they will understand for sure. So that's, uh, I, I'm not joking. Um, we try at Meljet to have the top management available at any time. So if we have a major disaster, they will understand why they have to maybe shift a bit the feature in, in the schedule and uh, have uh, time to build something strong. So yeah, for me, it's having top management on the call. Yeah, 
can uh, testify. I've seen the, the Maljet CTO uh, spending a whole night uh, debugging with the guy, so they did it. Um, and I'll say it's maybe a little bit different. Um, first of all, we will never postpone every single features because of um, technical depth or performance or refactoring. Uh, we are a customer-facing company. We are a customer-first company. We need to also think about our customer. And it's very important that every single developer in the team understand why we are doing this or that. Uh, we have doubled the revenue every year for the past few years. We want to continue doing it. It's not going to happen if you start refactoring. Uh, of course, it's not something you should avoid doing. Um, so what I, would, what I would say is always try to find how to get there instead of, like, if you need to implement this feature but you don't have time, instead of doing, I don't, instead of saying I don't have time, let's postpone it, try to think, okay, if I need to do it anyway, what can I do? Like, what are the shortcuts that I can take? What are the workarounds that I can do in order to both deliver and still focus on making sure that performance uh, improves. Um, also, if you think about performance day one, maybe those issues are less often, I don't know. No magical solution. Does it answer your question? Yeah, especially Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good advice. Emil, you want to add on that? We, we don't have any top management in the company yet, so... <laughs> You're the top, uh, yeah. top management. Yeah, um, yeah so... <laughs> cool. We had a, can you pass the mic to Thomas? Hi, I'm uh, Thomas from Forest. Uh, I'm quite interested on in how you are dealing with your performance in terms of communication, especially with your customers. I imagine your service is going down, your customers start to see like the search is not working, the emails are not sending, and, and etc. So all your marketing or communication team is dealing with that, and is there any like impact on your growth uh, in terms of like uh, churn of a customer like quitting your, your company project? So on our side, you log into your dashboard, the first thing you see is the performance of your search. So we display the first thing you see is a graph with the 90 percentile and the 99 percentile of your queries. So it's super important. When it comes to providing our, our customers with a guarantee of the search working, we actually have an SLA that is like way above what the market is used to provide. We're providing our customers with a 99.99% .99 SLA, which means we guarantee not to be down more than 40 seconds a month, which is pretty decent. Um, at AWS and others are at 99.95 or 99.9. Um, we stop doing that for, for everyone, um, mostly for just pricing reason, uh, but we are pretty confident in our infrastructure and we are pretty confident that we can deliver good performance to everyone uh, at any time. Um, we also implemented one thing, you were mentioning what Stripe did, we are doing the same. When we feel like the machine that is targeted has not enough CPU available to answer those requests, we are degrading the search features. So for instance, instead of allowing two typing mistakes in a single word, we would only allow one. Or if you have some optional boosting feature that ultimately consumes a lot of CPU, we will degrade a little bit those ones. Um. Um, so yeah, I have a, an interesting story on this because a few weeks ago, um, we are Traffic is relying on an external service to provide some uh, uh, TLS certificate, which is called Let's Encrypt, uh, which allows to uh, generate some automatic, some certificate automatically, uh, uh, some HTTPS certificate. And a uh, few weeks ago, uh, Let's Encrypt had a security issue on one of the tra challenge used by traffic to uh, generate certificate. And uh, from... Uh, um, and, and they just cut off the service uh, at that time. 
without any warning because they just discovered an, this issue. So, well, uh, <laughs> we had to deal with this because uh, this, world, this was what was using traffic uh, as default. And so we had many users that were uh, asking us, what are, what are you going to do? So um, we, we really had to be uh, super tr transparent with uh, the whole community and explain what was going on and what we were doing day after day I mean, really, day after day, <laughs> we had to explain the community what we were doing, and they just, they, they were super, super kind with us because they were just seeing that we, we, we were doing everything we could, uh, that was possible to, to manage this uh, uh, incident. And so, yeah, one week later, we, we released a, um, a fix on this, but we just have to be super transparent, and the in our case, the community will accept it. Yeah, I think uh, I, I plus one on Amy's thought. Uh, transparency is uh, the, the, the cheapest and uh, first uh, tier you can do. Like, be transparent, and probably people will be kind. That doesn't mean you want to uh, experience churn, you want to experience uh, uh, some hate, some bad buzz, but at least uh, you will uh, uh, have uh, gained trust with uh, the rest of your customer. Yeah. We, we are not used to communicate when we have bad performance because this is not happening a lot, but I, I definitely follow what others have been saying. When we had a security incident or uh, a downtime due to something else than performance, yes, we do provide uh, our customers with a post-mortem. We even went for blog posts at some point. Super important to be transparent. And most of the time, what the customer is answering back is, okay, thank you for telling us. At least we understand. You know, and yes, shits will happen, and they have that as well in their team. So it's it's even enforcing the trust you have with them by telling them the exact same, the exact thing. Um, small erratum as well. I said 40 seconds. It's four minutes. 40 seconds was with the five nine SLA that we are providing our enterprise customers. Uh, voilà. It's uh, good to precise. Yeah, um, at Mailjet, we try to always uh, protect the processing system. So if we have performance issues, we try to make everything asynchronous, uh, uh, but not for the processing system. So the, even if we have performance issues, we try to send the emails as fast as possible. Um, in terms of communication, um, one thing you can do, which is pretty uh, cool in terms of transparency, is that our status page is managed by our support team, meaning that the, the, the people um, that are able to communicate on this status page are the people that are uh, uh, contacted directly by the client when there is a problem. So they are uh, really uh, happy to be able to push transparently when there are problems to avoid receiving tickets. So it's one way to be sure that we will be always transparent and communicating on issues. Empathy. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot. Answer your question? Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. <laughs>